Let me now, Brother Painter, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to be the host so you can let people in. There you yes, go. sir. All right. Close. Okay. Uh, just welcome, everybody. Uh, appreciate everyone that is able to be with us tonight. Uh, appreciate those from uh, Brother Goss's Assembly in Keswick. Canada, and also there's a few that are from Brownsville, brother, under brother Rodriguez, Hugo Rodriguez. Uh, we weren't able to have our Zoom meeting Monday night, so I told them about tonight. Um, anyway, so we're recording this meeting. Um, and um, Anyway, I'll, I'm, I'm going to, I want to talk tonight, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot lately, uh, several months now, maybe even the whole year since COVID, you know, I've been doing a lot of talking about um, our time frame and where, uh, you know, what we, what to look for in the in prophecy for the end of the world, I've mentioned 12 things that, that uh, I think 12 things that will have to happen prophetically before the end of the Gentile world. And uh, so uh, tonight, I, I'm going to, I want to talk to you about the sixth and seventh chapter of the book of Revelations, because it's dealing with the time that we're living in. I know everyone, I believe everyone here is familiar, you know, with our teachings on the four horses, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. From that point on down in the sixth chapter, uh, you don't hear as near as much about that, are in the seventh chapter. And so I'd like to uh, maybe address um, you know, what I see uh, in the seven seals that are uh, mentioned here in the sixth and seventh chapter um, of the book of Revelation. Um, the first thing I want to say is I'd like to try to give you some understanding about um, how the the seals and the trumpets and the vials are put together in the book of the revelation so it's it's you know i mean sometimes when people talk about this it sounds like it's going to be really complicated well it's not it's not you know nothing's complicated if you understand it uh, it's like um um I always use this uh, this uh, example. I don't know. I've always picked a, a combustion engine, like an automobile engine. You know, of course, I I used to uh, be in auto mechanic school when I was young, and so it's something I understand a little bit about. I don't understand anything about the new car engines today that all operate on computer. But if you can take me back to the 60s, I can I can tell you about a, a, an automobile's engine in the 60s. <laughs> they called us shade tree mechanics back in those days. But um, and, and the example I've always given is, is that, you know, if you don't know how a combustible engine, like an automobile engine works and all the parts and what makes it work um it would take someone that knows you know a mechanic that really knows that engine that can tear it completely down and put it all back together they know what all you know they know what the cam they know what the the valves they know what the pistons they know what the 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 main block the the short block the little block uh that puts it together they know about all the rods and the rings and all of the different parts of it and why it 
is able to run once you start it, why it can continue to run. If you understood all the parts about it, you'd understand a lot more about that engine. And it's the same way about God's word. You know, if, uh, if you understand, uh, when someone opens your understanding about, uh, you know, I mean, like for an example, an engine, you, you just know it's an engine but you don't know the internal parts or you don't know the why or how it works. And it's the same way in the word of God, in the word of God, like for an example, the seals, it may, it may sound foreign, but when someone explains the seals, then it, you know, it just makes a lot more sense. And it's the same way with the trumpets and the vials. Uh, and a lot of, Ministers don't deal with that because that's just not their gift. It just seems to be my gift. that That's something that God's dealt with me about a lot over the last 30 years or so. And uh, it's taken me a long time to understand a lot of parts about the book of Revelations. But um, I want to, and, and I know the church here has heard me say it before, but um, I just know that everybody doesn't get it the first time, the second time, the third time, or even more times, a lot of times. Um, so here's what I want you to understand about the seven seals. And, and the seals are, you know, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, and then the souls under the altar. And then, uh, then the sixth seal and the seventh seal. I'll explain more about that in a minute. But the first six seals, here's what I want you to understand about the first six seals. They are, they are given in synoptic form. When I say synoptic, it's just a, a summary form, just a very short summary. Like for an example, the white horse, is, you know, all it tells you about the white horse is there was a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's it. That's what you know about the, about the white horse. That's very synoptic, just a very short summary. Well, we've went through the Bible to, to find that horses in prophecy in the Bible represent the church. And, uh, and colors represent something. White represents righteousness. Red, the red horse represents sin. Black, black the color black represents darkness or ignorance. Uh, and then the pale horse. Um, you know, in the Spanish Bible, it, the, their Bible calls the pale horse uh, amarillo. The color, yeah, it, that, that's yellow. Well, that's the color of death, you know, or, um, and so, and, the, and pale, you know, would, is, is how the English word uh, treats that Greek word in interpretation. But what I'm, all I'm telling you is this, is that those seals are just a very syn in synoptic form Except now the sixth seal has a lot more information in it. And we're going to get to that because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the horses because I know y'all know what that is. Um, so the, the reason the sixth seal has quite a bit more information, even though it is in summary form, it's a lot more information because because the sixth seal is the final seal in synoptic form. It's like, okay, if y'all can understand what I'm saying, it's like these seals are, each one of them are, are an index. It's like an index that's just indexing what the book of Revelation is about. The first six seals actually are talking about the whole book of Revelation in summary, and it ends in the sixth chapter. The seventh seal opens in the seventh chapter, 
uh, I'm sorry, it ends in the, the sixth seal ends in the seventh chapter. The eighth uh, chapter is a seventh seal. And that seal opens up in chapter eight and it's, it never closes until the end of the book. That seal is all the information that's given in the first six seals that is in synoptic form. Does that make sense to you? Am I making, is it, am I making uh, a reasonable sense that, you know, in other words, even though like the first seal is a white horse, well, uh, in the seventh seal, when it opens, it starts telling you what happened in the white horse. It'll continue. It only, the only difference is it doesn't put, it, it uses different allegories. Uh, and when I say allegory, I'm talking about different pictures to explain the same, the white horse was the early church. It was Christ. Oh, as the head of that white church, it was a righteous divine order of God. And that's explained in the seventh seal. And it, but it also, you know, goes through and explains the red horse, how the church fell away. It shows you uh, all the details of what took place back there in the early church and and what's going to happen in the Gentile world. In fact, that's the reason for writing the book of Revelations. The book of Revelation is written to uh, help the Gentiles understand what is going to happen, what all has happened, what is happening, and what's going to happen before the final judgment in the Gentile world. I made a statement recently that the book of Ezekiel is the apocalypse book to the, Gen to the Jews. Way back in Ezekiel's days, he prophesied of what was going to happen in the end of the Jewish world. Uh, John prophesied in the end of the Jewish world to the Gentiles what's going to happen in the end of the Gentile world. God does that, uh, even though it couldn't be understood until the latter days of each world. And so, in fact, remember this, almost every scripture in the New Testament that talks about the latter days, the last time, the end time, is talking about the end of the Jewish world, not the end of the Gentile world. It was talking to those people about their last days and their end time. Okay, so <clears throat> um, now I'm just going to say a little bit here. The trumpets, the trumpet starts blowing in the eighth chapter of the book of Revelations, and though there's, there's seven trumpets, it starts off with Christ, the first trumpet, and it goes through all the trumpets until the seventh trumpet. And when the seventh trumpet blows, it blows to the end. It's in the seventh seal. The entire book is in the seventh seal. It, uh, I mean, is in the seven seals. I'm sorry, in the seventh seal. From the fourth chapter on, it begins to tell the future. And when the seventh seal opens, it never closes. That, that I, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, the seventh seal. It's the same way with the seven trumpets. The seven trumpet doesn't blow until it's the last trumpet in the end. It's a trumpet message in the end of the Gentile world. And when it starts blowing, it never quits blowing until Armageddon. It, 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 in fact, it goes beyond Armageddon a little bit. Uh, it's, it's just a trumpet message. That's what a trumpet is. It's a message. Then the seven vials are just the seven complete eternal judgment that God puts on the end of the Gentile world. And so the seven trumpets doesn't start until the last, it's, it starts in the last prophetical hour. So anyway, that's a, just a little bit on the seals and the trumpets and the vials. Uh, now, I'm just going to deal with the vials here. To, I mean, the, uh, the, the seals tonight. 
So I know everybody knows in, in, in the sixth chapter, if you want to go to your Bible, as a matter of fact, let me see. Uh, I'll do that in just a minute. Let me just ask y'all a question. Oh, wow. Uh, Brother Painter, is almost everybody seem to be in? I mean, I know you can't tell, but is there not anybody been trying to get in lately? Uh, I think. Sorry. Um, if you would, uh, if you just give me. I, I think, okay. I think everybody that's going to be on tonight is here. Um, okay. We're missing several folks, but I think probably anybody that's going to participate is already in. Okay. Uh, if, if you would give me the host back, I, I, I may give it back to you, but yes, sir. Uh, I want to try something before we go too far. Just let me know when you did. Sure is now. Okay. Here's what I'm going to show y'all. Um, Let me see if we can do this. Okay, can y'all see my can y'all see my Bible? And and uh, I mean I know you see me talking, but you can see my Bible also, can't you? Somebody say yes or no. Yes, sir. We can see half of you, half of the screen is your Bible. How about so, that? Is that better? Much better. Full screen. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, and also, you know, if, if you want, if you got a question, you want to ask a question while I'm talking, well, uh, you know, you can just interrupt me and let me know. Um, but, um, okay, so if you can see my Bible here in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, again, I think everybody knows. Uh, can you see my cursor okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I think everyone knows that the white horse was the early church with Christ being the head. He was the one that was the rider of the horse going forth, conquering and to conquer. And then the second seal opens up in the third verse and in the fourth verse, the horse was red. Power was given to him to set there on to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. That, I'm just going to hurry through this, but the, 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 the red horse is a Pentecostal type era. In other words, it, the church fell from a, a divine order, white horse stage, to a red horse, which is a type of sin entered into the church, and it left the divine order of Christ being the head where man became more the head of the church and, um, and a great sword was given to a rider. It's a different rider. Christ was no longer the rider of the horse. It was man that took charge. And that's a Pentecostal type era, time frame. Um, and then uh, when the third seal opens, um, there was a black horse, and um, the black horse is a type of, it is a, um, um, that's a, a Protestant type era. People begin to lose the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Darkness set in on the church. There was um, you know, there was um, a lot of uh, a lack of understanding. And um, so, and there was a pair of balances in this, in, in his hand saying, uh, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. That, that's just showing you that it was a time, a spiritual famine. The black horse is a type of ignorance, lack of understanding, darkness concerning understanding the things of God, 
and uh, and he's given a, a picture, an allegory here, where there's a, a a measure of wheat for a penny. That word penny means it means uh, denarium, and that was a Roman soldier's pay in that day for a for a day's wages. And so you can get a measure of wheat for a whole day's pay, or you can get three measures of barley. Uh, wheat uh, is a more expensive grain uh, than barley, but they both represent the truth of God's word. A lot, I've heard a lot of preachers saying barley, you know, represented falsehood. That's not true. Barley in the Bible is a good grain, and it represents the good word of God but it doesn't represent as much understanding or wisdom as wheat would represent. Um, you know, God's gonna separate the wheat from the chaff. Remember he's using wheat there as, as uh, those who have the word of God and have come to a full development of the he a head of grain, grain of wheat. Um, and so it's just, uh, it's just showing there was a famine there was a pair of balances, and and you you could buy you could buy a measure of wheat is the pitcher with a day's wages, or you could buy three measures of barley, which would balance that out. But you'd get a lot less for your three measures of barley than you got with just one day's wages, and you'd just get a small measure no matter how you got it because it was very scarce and it was very. It's like very expensive to get an under, any understanding of the word of God in a dark day. So, and then in the, okay, the fourth seal, verse seven, the fourth seal opened and he heard the voice of the fourth beast saying, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. Don't make the mistake of thinking that the, uh, that that death and hell was the writer. It was death that was the writer, and hell followed with it. Death is a ministry of the Catholic Church that had no life or no anointing in their message. And hell, that represents a, a religious system, a hellish condition that followed once the Catholic Church was set up in, in religious um, traditions, uh, man-made traditions, a religious system followed that or followed with that. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and death and with the beast of the earth. Well, the first three parts was the the white horse, the red horse, and the pale horse. Once the Catholic Church came into power, they were they had power over all of the remainder of religion to kill with the sword, the word of God, and with hunger and death, and with beast of the earth. And that's talking about beastly ways. Okay, and then. He opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the uh, altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. Now, let me say something right here, because in the body, years ago, we, uh, our forefathers began to try to figure this out. What altar is this talking about? Where... Uh, who were these people that were killed? Let's go ahead and read verse 10. It says, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Well, our old, our teaching has been in the past that this was bride members that made the bride in the early church. I do not agree with that. I do not see how that's even possible. And here's why. Because this is given to us in chronological order. You, you can't just take this scripture out and put it back 
in the white horse stage and and um, not leave it in the setting that it's being given in here. It's giving after after the pale horse stage. The pale horse comes into power and a religious and hellish system follows that. The next thing that happens chronologically is their souls under the altar. Okay, number one, those souls under the altar, and I'm giving you, by the way, I'm not trying to tear, I'm not really trying to tear down. I understand that there's brothers that don't see it this way, but I'm just giving you my perspective and my position on this book. You can listen to other brothers and you can arrive at how you think, uh, who you think's right. Uh, but I have a lot of reasons why. I don't, I, I used to teach it exactly the way I was taught it. Uh, that they were souls under the altar, you know, under the golden altar in the holy place. There's a lot of problems with that because the holy place in the tabernacle or the temple represents second heaven. Uh, it represents a second heaven condition or a divine order of God. And, um, you know, uh, these people uh, were living in a time where I don't see where that was available to them. And I'm not taking it back to the bride members of the early church. I think that takes it out of context. Plus, there is no place under the golden altar that anybody is sacrificed. Never is there a sacrifice. Under, the sacrifices are under the brazen altar in the outer court. The blood of the sacrifice was taken in uh, to the holy place. Uh, but, that, but that golden altar in there was a, an altar of incense to offer up the prayers and praises of the saints. Uh, it was, and, and that was in a divine order of God. It wasn't a place where you, your sacrifice had to be make, uh, taking place out in the outer court. Okay, so who are these people? Well, they're people that were martyred by the Catholic Church. The, these people are after uh, the pale horse comes into existence after the hellish condition of religion comes in. These people were martyred. Millions of millions of people were martyred by the Catholic Church. It's history. You can research it. it uh, they called people heretics. If if you didn't accept everything that the Catholics taught, they would they they murdered people, burned them at the stake because they did not want them bringing division in whatever the Catholic Church was teaching. So that's who I'm saying this is. Now, uh, verse 10 says, they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And verse 11, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Well, uh, okay, let's look at this. Verse 11, white robes were given to every one of them. White robes represent righteousness. And that, that what was given to these people was imputed righteousness because of their faith and because of what Christ did on the, on the cross, God counted them righteous. They were imputed righteousness. They were given robes. But in a, a few minutes, we're going to see in the seventh chapter that there was a group that had to wash their robes and make them white. And that's what you and I, right now, you and I, we're washing our robes and making them white, but God has imputed righteousness to us and counted us worthy because of the work of Christ on the, on the cross. I'll address that in just a minute. I'll say a little bit more about it. Okay. And then it says, you're going to have, they, they said, how long is it going to be, Lord, before you judge 
and avenge our blood on them that did this to us. There's nothing, you know, there's no people actually doing that. This is just showing that God is aware. God is aware that these people were martyred. They and no one's been judged who did this to them. God's aware that there's a judgment that needs to take place. But he tells them, I'm not going to judge it. I can't judge it right now. He's saying, um, let's see here. Not Okay, I want you to rest for a little season until your fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. If this happened to the people in the, if this is talking about the early church people that were persecuted so heavily in the early church, see, God judged that. He judged all of that in AD 7. He brought judgment and vengeance on what happened to those people when he judged that world. But it's certainly not a little season for 2,000 years for God to judge that in the end of our world. But after the Catholic Church came into existence and ruled, and it wasn't until the 1500s that uh, all of this took place during that 1260 years, and when God looked back on it, he looked back on it and said, I am going to judge it, but I, I'm not going to judge it right now. It's going to be a little while before I can judge it. So it was, it was going to be from the 1500s to down here in our time, much shorter period of time that God is going to avenge the blood of those martyrs and everyone else that's going to be. The persecution's not over yet. The reason God did not avenge that blood yet is because the system of Babylon and religious system of the hellish condition. God can't judge that because it's the iniquity isn't full yet of the Gentile time. God is waiting for that system to finally come to its fullness where he can bring eternal judgment on it and stop it forever out of the end of our world. Uh, I want to give you something on this because I think this is very important. Um, before we go to the 12th chapter, I just want to deal with these saints under the altar. Okay. I admitted somebody. Okay. So um, I want to, I'm just going to show you real quick here in Romans, the fourth chapter. Okay. Here, Paul's talking. He's talking in his letter to the Romans. And he says, in the fourth chapter, in the first verse, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not, of, not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Not to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they uh, whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. See, he's showing right there, he's quoting. Let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can move this over. Oh, I'll put it down below. Okay, so um, what scripture is that? Uh, David, verse 6. Okay, so he's quoting from Psalms. What is that 146, Brother Durham? I'm going to look that up for me and see where that quote's from. Well, I'm, well, I'm going to go on down now, and I'm going to show you 
that he was talking about Abraham here and the fact that he was counted righteous because of faith. He was also, uh, in righteousness was imputed to him. In other words, he wasn't righteous. God just didn't count him righteous. Okay, so now go down to the lower part of the, of the chapter. Uh, okay, in verse 21, he's still talking about uh, Sarah and Abraham, and being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus from, our, uh, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith unto the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, so I'm just showing you here in Romans 4 that because of God's, of, of the work of Christ and because God counts us righteous. I'm telling you that's what these white robes that were given to these people were. They were they were counted righteous for because of their righteousness. And therefore uh, God gave them white robes is just a picture. They were counted righteous and God could not avenge their blood and judge the religious system or the hellish condition, not at that time. Now, I'm going to show you this real quick in Revelations. Um, 19 and verse one. I want to show you. I want to show you when God. Welcome, Brother Rodriguez. Uh, here's where God is going to avenge the blood of those saints under the altar, as well as everyone else that's going to be persecuted and killed in like manner. After God judges Babylon, remember the 18th chapter of the book of Revelations? God is, is going to, he's going to get all of his people out of Babylon that he can get out of Babylon, come out of her, my people. And when he gets everyone out of that that can, he is going to judge that system. He's going to remove their candle. He's going to remove the voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom. He's going to remove um, the uh, light of the, I said, the light of the candle. He's going to move the, remove the, the craftsmen, ministers, all, all the, anyone that has an anointing out there. God is going to remove everything out there, and he's going to judge that system, and it's going to come to naught in one hour. That's the last prophetical hour. And in 19, when he finishes this judgment, in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, first verse, it says, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power and the Lord unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth and her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. We'll never forget the judgment that God puts on the evil, right, religious evil of man systems. When God, God will judge that system in the same way he judged in the end of the Gentile, Jewish world, he judged that system over there. In AD 70, and um, that's what the second trumpet was, is the apostles, uh, they cast uh, the a mountain. Let's see how the, how does it say that uh, they cast a mountain into the sea. That mountain of Jewish religion that missed God. They removed the influence of that by preaching the truth 
and judged it because they had eternal judgment in the divine order of God was able to judge that system and cast it back out into the world. It had no more influence over the people of God that were in the body of Christ that understood the truth. So they judged that system back there. There was a war in heaven and the lamb of God, Michael and his army won that war. And so God is not dealing with those people that made the bride or avenging their blood. He already has. He's going to avenge those that suffer down through the Gentile times. Okay, so now let's go back to the sixth chapter. Okay, now, uh, verse 12. I'm going to, I don't know that we'll get done with the seventh chapter altogether, but we'll go as far as we can here. Verse 12 said, and I beheld. Now, this is chronological order. This is after God is showing now. Now, look, I know that after the Catholic Church, there were many martyrs. There's a judgment that needs to take place concerning those that persecuted and killed my servants, and I will deal with that, but I can't do it right now because I have to wait till it's time to judge that system, give it eternal judgment, and judge it completely. It wasn't time. God couldn't judge. God didn't even have a, a people that had the power of God to judge that or the word of God to judge that at that time. So it, ha it had to wait. Okay, now, verse 12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Okay, now we're in the sixth seal today. And there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. And the stars fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Okay, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island, these are, this is uh, mountains in the Bible prophet, prophetically represent religious systems. They're a rise in the earth. Something that, that is above the lowly, uh, the sea represents the world. A mountain represents something higher than the sea. It has a greater influence. God's going to judge every mountain of religion out here except for Mount Zion, the true mountain of God, and every island. See, there's some systems that have rose up out of the world and little religious systems that... Uh, you know, they're like an island, uh, and they were moved out of their places, and kings of the earth, and the great men, and rich men, and chief captains, mighty men, every bond man, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This is, we're living in the sixth uh, seal right now, um, where we haven't, um, we haven't, this earthquake hasn't taken place yet, but the time frame that we're in is a time frame where, when this earthquake is going to take place, and the wrath of God's going to come because judgment's going to come in the end of this world. So this is in the sixth seal, but it's going to take place actually in the seventh seal and in the seventh trumpet. It, in other words, you know, in other words, right now we're just getting the synoptic form of it, but it's going to be, it's going to, we're going to see more and have more understanding. What I showed you in the 19th chapter a minute ago is in the seventh seal, that eternal judgment that's going to come on Babylon, it's in the seventh seal. It's it's also given in the sixth seal in synoptic form. See what I'm telling you about synoptic form or summary form as being part of the index of what all is going to take place in the seventh seal. Am I going so fast that it just is it rolling over y'all's heads, or you following me a little bit? Can you all? You know, we, I'm following you, Brother Smith, and I don't know if you would be open for a quick question for clarification. Go ahead and ask it. Okay, so 
uh, in verse 10, those that were murdered on, um, on, in verse 10 under the altar. So are you saying that they, that, that group, that more, they were murdered after, after 8070? Meaning uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, between 8030 to 8070, we have the 40 year period of the church. The White Horse period, and this group that were murdered um, on the they said their blood was under the altar. Are they part of the man child that was at the church photos in the in the early church, or they're going to be part of the the Gentile world this, uh, in our time? They're part of the Gentile world. It had nothing to do with anybody in the bride of the of the early church. These people were not, they were not persecuted until after the Catholic Church came into power. This is given in chronological order, Brother Bai. Mm -hmm. they, they, in other words, see, you have a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, a pale horse, mm -hmm. and then people wind up under the altar. They're murdered. They're martyred. Those people... And that took place after the Catholic Church came into existence. You cannot take this take this out and move it all the way back to the early church. Mm -hmm. It's given in chronological order. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I, yes. Yes, it's given in chronological order. It's just like the sixth seal. There's going to be a great earthquake, and that hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> I'm going to explain to you what it is, but that hasn't happened yet. And um, all of this is taking place chronologically in date order, mm -hmm. one after the other. If each one of them are in a, a uh, time frame or era of time, mm -hmm. and one follows the other. That's mm -hmm. why I, I think we're grossly mistaken to try to move these people under these altars. Again, I'm showing you their white robes was not that they were perfect. Those white robes was imputed righteousness. Yes. They didn't wash their robes and make them white. Mm -hmm. That was imputed to those people. They're counted worthy because of their faith. It happened in a time when there was gross darkness in the earth. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, uh, you, I just don't feel like you can put this back there. It makes much more reasonable sense to hold it in the order that it is given in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brother Smith, I understand uh, the, the white world was, okay, imputed righteousness. I understand that. Um, you know, it's very clear. And those that were part of the man-child during that 40-year period, how did they receive the, the, the persecution? Who persecuted them? Who killed them? Well, uh, Herod, who was the head of the he was the emperor of the roman of rome mm -hmm. he was a terrible he persecuted he 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 killed james the apostle james mm -hmm. uh very early he he killed all the apostles mm -hmm. he was a he was the the jew i mean the roman emperors were were terrible uh, persecutors of the church they tried to stamp it out that's why John the Baptist was the last living apostle, and he was exiled on the island of Patmos to shut him up so he couldn't preach anymore. If he ever left Patmos, they would kill him. That his exile was, the rule of Rome was, is that I'm, I'm exiling you on this island. If you leave this island, I'll kill you. Mm -hmm. That shut him up where the gospel couldn't be preached by John anymore. The, the Roman law was, is that when the emperor died, anyone who was exiled by him was automatically freed. Mm -hmm. uh, Nero died in AD 68, and John the Baptist, uh, history shows us that John the Baptist left the island of Patmos and went to Ephesus and was there until he died. So he got free, but he didn't get free until Nero died. 
Uh, and therefore, I think the book of Revelation was written before A.D. 68. Mm -hmm. And when, when Nero died in 68, John had already wrote that book. And he went to Ephesus, and that's where he died. Uh, in the first chapter of the book of Revelations, it's, it tells us that God told Jesus to send his angel to show this to John, things that must shortly come to pass, for the time was at hand. What must shortly come to pass was A.D. 70. That, that's why he needed to write those letters to those seven churches. And what uh, time was at hand, it was time for God to, to reveal to those churches that A.D. 70, the judgment of A.D. 70 was quickly to come upon them. And it was time for John to write the book of Revelation the last script, scriptures to the Gentile world so that it would be recorded. Uh, even though it wouldn't be understood for many years, it would be recorded so that the Gentiles would know what was, what was going to take place in the end of their world. I'm sure that the early church, John and those seven churches, pretty well understood this book because I know they understood the symbols of prophecy. They had the truth of the word of God. They still, they were even called a seven-fold candlestick church. That was what was in his hand, was seven stars, which was the seven bishops of the church, and seven candlesticks. That, and, and he told Ephesus, if you don't do what I'm telling you, I'm going to remove your candlestick. That was a candlestick church. They had a sevenfold life. So they understood this book. They understood all these symbols pretty well. We're the ones that didn't understand it. So the early church persecution took place by Rome and, and Judaism. The, they, they killed Jesus. The Jews were the ones that talked Rome into giving them the power so that they'd kill Jesus and everybody else that they were against because it was a false religious system, just like the beast of today <coughs> will be. It was the head of it was Rome. Uh, it'll be Rome again down here before it's over with, before the eighth head is made up. But uh, again, these, these souls under the altar had nothing to do with the early church. Those people were martyred back there. They were persecuted back there. And God judged that system that murdered them and persecuted them. God judged Rome. He judged the Jews. He finished the judgment back there on that world, and it ended. They've been they the Jews have been judged ever since. They're antichrist people, and so uh, we we cannot put this judgment back there. That took place back there. The Bible is very clear on, on the judgment that God administered in the end of that world. Okay. Uh, lastly, Brother Smith, uh, just for clarification, and this group of people that were murdered, whose blood was under the altar, are they, um, you know, these are, is, are, are they, are they, okay, were, were they people that were, that came into to the church of believers after at the end of the 8070 or maybe were, were they part of the 1260 years they're part of the 1260 years they had nothing to do with anything until after the catholic church was established oh, these so people they, were these people were martyred by the catholic church okay and their brothers that are going to be killed in like manner is us down here in the end of this world when heavy persecution is going to once again be on the church and that'll take place in the last prophetical hour okay and i showed i'm showing that in in the uh you know how that god finally gets vengeance on these people and <clears throat> on the rest of all martyrs in the in the uh gentile world 
mm -hmm. in, in Revelations 19, 1, after he judges Babylon eternally and Babylon is completely destroyed and God gets his people out of there, that's when judgment, that's when his vengeance is going to finally come on that system in the Gentile world down here. Praise the Lord. Thank you. It's, it's clear now. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so now, now we're we're in the um, we're in the twelfth chapter, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Okay, I was showing you the, the wrath of the Lamb is going to come in this great day of God's judgment in the seventh trumpet that's going to take place. This is the sixth seal, and it's just a summary form. It's going to take, it's going to, it'll show a lot more about it in, in later in the book of Revelation in the in the seventh seal, but here in the sixth seal, it's just a synoptic index to what is going to happen in the seventh seal. So this great earthquake, I say that this great earthquake is the United States of America being judged, and God is going to shake this whole world when he shakes this nation and brings it down. Now, let me show you something here. Okay. Uh, I've got here, can y'all see this little box? Did it come up where y'all can see it? Can y'all yes, see that? Yes, we can see okay. it. Okay. okay. This is the same as how Israel fell in AD 70. That this is this judgment on, on the what I feel is the United States as this great earthquake. Okay. The U.S. goes down in judgment. Okay, let me show you when God put Egypt, Pharaoh, Egypt out in Ezekiel 32, 7. Here's what he said. He said, I'll put thee out and I'll cover the heavens and make the stars thereof dark. And I'll cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. And the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee and set darkness upon the land, saith the Lord. I will also vex the hearts of many people when I shall bring thy destruction upon nations into the countries which thou hast not known. So see, if, if you go back in this chapter, in verse two, he said, son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's what this is about. God is showing Ezekiel here that when he put Egypt out is a dragon power. When he took them down, he turned the lights out. You see, a dragon power, a nation that's a dragon power is a light to the world. Egypt was a light to the whole world. Babylon was a light to the world. I'm going to show you that in Isaiah 13. But so uh, America is a, is a light to the whole world. The entire world looks to America for leadership and, and engages the whole world by what America's doing. Well, when God judges this nation, he's going to turn the lights out. We no longer will be a light to the world. Look in Isaiah 13, 10. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, okay. Uh, The, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. So see, he's talking about Babylon. Let me go back down here um, to, let me go to the 10th, uh, the ninth verse. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, and the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I'll punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. 
In other words, here he's just showing you when he puts out a dragon power, when he put out Egypt, and when he put out Babylon, he turned the lights out. The lights of heaven went out, were turned off. That, that, that's what's going to happen. Now let's go back here. When this earthquake takes place, the sun becomes dark. I'm in the 12th chapter here. At the moon becomes blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth. I'm just showing you when God puts America out, it's going to shake this world and the lights are going to go out when he puts this nation out as a, it's, it's becoming a dragon power. And they're going to see that the wrath of God is coming upon this nation and upon this world. And so now I'm going to give you, uh, let's go to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations. I am recording this. So, you know, if you think, well, I'm already lost. I, I sometimes I, you know, people tell me sometimes it's it, it was too much to contain. So I'm not, you know, uh, I don't know how to tell it any different. I mean, I don't know how to cover it any different way. Um, okay, so in the eleventh chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, that was something else I was in. Okay. <clears throat> It starts off, uh, it said, there was given to me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood, saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, or without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it's given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, and they shall tread it underfoot 40 and two months. That's the same as 1,203 score days. He says here, and I'll give power to my two witnesses, which is the word of God, the Old and New Testament, and they'll prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. That's the 1,260 years that the Catholic Church ruled the world. Okay, so this is talking about the church in its falling condition. And <clears throat> so... Uh, it's just showing here how the church had fell away, come under this, in this condition. Let me read a little bit. Verse four, these are two olive trees and the two candlesticks before the Lord, the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Even though the word of God prophesied in sackcloth and ashes, it still was the word of God. Sin, sin, and the word of God, you will be judged for every deed. I don't care who you are or when you commit these deeds. The truth of the word of God will judge. It's going to judge every sin, everything. Verse 6, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And I have power over water to turn them to blood and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. If you'll remember, the Elijah prophesied that it wouldn't rain for uh, three and a half years. Is that right? Was it three and a half years? And so it was going to be a dearth or, or famine over the land. The word of God, the prophecy of the word of God always holds true. It had power to to, to uh, devour its enemies, shut up heaven, there wouldn't be any rain. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. That's talking about the Catholic Church that, that uh, destroyed the truth of the word of God uh, with their religious system. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So that's talking about um, the reason it's called the, 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 the Old and New Testament. The word of God was of none effect in the Catholic Church. And they were spiritually, it was spiritually called Sodom because it was man's intimacy with man 
man's ideology. And um, where else does it say that? And Egypt, which is a type of the world. It was a type of the worldly religious ideology of man. That's why it's called that. Verse nine, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. In other words, they're not gonna, they, they didn't do away with the word of God. They did chain every Bible to every, every pulpit where only a Pope of Rome could ever even read it. A, a regular person couldn't even read the Bible. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another because the two prophets tormented that were on the earth. The word of God condemned. See, but when they when when they had the word of God fixed where it couldn't be read, nobody could use it to, to show there was sin. Um, they made merry. They gave gifts to men. In other words, they 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 made their own men. Uh, priests and prophets, and it, were, it was a man-made religious system, okay? But then look at verse 11, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell upon them that saw them. Then after three days and a half, after the 1260 years, you know, then there was a verse 12 said, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's a restored church, that cloud. And their enemies beheld them. And that's showing the restored church. Finally, the church is going to be restored God's finally going to, these two witnesses are finally going to stand up on their feet. I think they already have, but God hadn't took us into second heaven yet. Come up hither, and we've ascended into heaven in the cloud or restored church, and their be, enemies beheld them, and the same hour, there was a great earthquake. That's why I wanted to bring this scripture to you. I want to link it together with that earthquake. <clears throat> that I read to you in the sixth chapter. America is going to fall when God restores the church. God will judge this nation. And, uh, and so a tenth part of the city fell in the earthquake where slain men, 7,000, a remnant were frightened and gave glory to God in heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. I, I don't have time to go over it, but I will tell you, that the first woe uh, was Catholicism and Mohammedism. It was Mohammedism bringing a woe to the Catholic Church, which removed their focus from off of the Restoration and the Reformers, and kept them busy fighting fighting with the with Mohammedism, and that allowed the Reformation to take place. The second woe is the fall of America, and the third woe is the Battle of Armageddon. So those are the three woes, but I'm, I'm just telling you what they are. I don't have time to go into them right now. Okay, verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this earth are become the kingdoms of, this, of our Lord and his Christ, and he'll reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty arrows which sat before God, their seats fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God, which art, was, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, <clears throat> and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament. There was lightnings and voices and thunderings and earth great and great hell. That's judgment. This chapter, verse 18 here, after the church comes into 
a divine order and is restored, <clears throat> there's a resurrection here in the 18th verse that it's the time of God's wrath because eternal judgment is set up in the restored church and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to his saints, and to them that fear his name, small and great. So God, there's the time of the dead. There's a resurrection there of the just that will resurrect after the church is restored. And those people, those people under the altar will come up in that resurrection. Those people that were under that altar in, in the fifth seal, they're going to come up in that resurrection because they're righteous. They've got white robes. They're just. That's what just means. It means righteous. It means upright. It means wise. It means saints. It means blessed of God. Those people will come up in, the resur in a resurrection of the just. Okay, now let me go back to this. Let me go back now to the seventh chapter. Um, and I suppose. I don't know. Can I? What can I do with this thing? Can I move it back? I can move it right there. Okay. Um, yeah, it's already C eight seventeen. So <clears throat> uh, maybe we better maybe we better quit for tonight. I'll say this much to you about the seventh chapter. Okay. The seventh chapter, and and. There has to be quite a bit of explaining on it, but there is there is twelve thousand. See, let me read these first uh, three verses. It said after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And there was 12,000 in each tribe sealed, 144,000. Now, some people teach that this is 144,000 natural Jews that will be grafted back in. I do not teach that that way. Uh, I don't, I, I, I've got a lot of reasons why I don't. But um, here he said, After this, I load a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne, before the Lord, clothed in white robes and with palms in their hands. Well, look down in 14. He said, sir, he, he's asking him, who are these people in white robes? Verse 13. Verse 14 said, these are they that came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. See, the, the, uh, it's going to take uh, washing your robes and making them white to reach perfection. But I show that these 144,000 here are 144,000 bride members that are made up in the end uh, in the Gentile world. There was a there was another 144,000 in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation that was made that made up the bride in the early church. Now let me explain that because that's two groups of 144,000. The, I don't see that the 144,000 it is, is at all a literal number. It's just a prophetical number that shows a government. It's a governmental number. In the 27th chapter of First Chronicles, uh, David had 288,000 in his administration. And I say that that's who these two, it's a type of these 244,000 groups are that makes up the administration of the rulership of Christ that will rule and reign with them for a thousand years. It's just 144,000 governmental number of people 
And here in the seventh chapter, it it it's showing this is still in the sixth trumpet. This is still the sixth seal. Um, wait a minute, am I right about that? Yes. Okay. So, um, and and when you read this, it finishes the whole work of God. See, uh, in he's in verse fourteen said I he said thou knowest he said unto me these are they that came out of great tribulation washed their robes made them white blood of the lamb. This is a a a number <coughs> which no man could not. This is talking about the new earth people down through the, the millennial. Uh, and so it's, he's going on with what's going to happen in the end of the, in synoptic form, in the end of the Gentile world. They'll hunger no more, neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat or judgments, what that means. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, lead them unto living fountains of water and wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's, it's almost saying that like it is in the end of the book when God's work is finished. In fact, that's what it's saying. It's just in synoptic form or in summary form. So that in summary form, the, the sixth and seventh chapter finishes the whole work of God from the first seal or from the early church to the end of the book in summary form. Now the eighth chapter that's when the seventh seal opens, eight chapter, verse one. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. That's when Jesus built the spiritual temple. It's a type. If you go back to first Kings, um, it was, it took seven and a half years to build the, the temple. And that's just, that's, that's a, type of seven of a space of half an hour christ he built the temple in his ministry he put together the spiritual temple that that was a allegory or picture of the half hour <clears throat> then the trumpet started sounding and christ was the first trumpet the apostles were the second trumpet it, he goes, he starts showing everything that happened. He's starting all over here. So he starts showing from the day of Pentecost forward what was going to happen. And it goes through the book of Revelation explaining the details of everything that's going to happen based in chronological order, except from time to time, he goes back to the day of Pentecost and begins to um fill in some details that was left out in other parts because there's a lot of details, but it just continues moving forward to the end of the Gentile world. Anyway, I'll explain the seventh chapter in a greater way later, but uh, I thought I might be able to explain all of that tonight, but I should have known better, huh? huh? Anyway, God bless your hearts for listening to me. Anybody got a question before I, Close tonight. I've always said this is such a smart group. They got they don't have questions. They know it. They got it. Either it's either that or they don't know what question to ask. <laughs> anyway, I'm just going on with you guys. Anyway, thank you all. Everybody, turn your mic your microphone on and let's give God a praise before we close. Praise tonight. the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus.